Welcome to Distributed Systems and Blockchain in the News. My name is Thomas Bocek and this is a short weekly summary of interesting news that is relevant for my Distributed Systems and Blockchain lecture here at the Eastern University of Applied Sciences. This week we are diving into a historic moment in the cryptocurrency market. Let's start with what just happened this week. Bitcoin, the world's largest cryptocurrency, has reached a remarkable milestone by crossing 100,000 US dollar and this wasn't just a brief spike. Bitcoin showed its maturity by maintaining stability around this level since a couple of days. The entire crypto market capitalization has grown to 3.8 trillion US dollars with Bitcoin dominance of 56%. And the institutional adoption we are seeing is a prime example of how this can scale. Consider this one Bitcoin ETF reached 50 billion in assets under management in just 228 days, the fastest growth rate ever recorded for any ETF. This rapid integration of traditional financial infrastructure with blockchain technology is testing the network's ability to handle increased load and complexity. And Bitcoin now also ranks the seventh largest asset globally. Here gold on the top and on the seventh place we have Bitcoin. And from a technical standpoint, the market's behavior reveals interesting patterns. Daily trading volumes are hitting record highs, yet the system maintains stability. The derivatives market data suggests a 6% probability of reaching 150,000 US dollar by January. Though remember, as with any system, past performance doesn't guarantee future behavior. And here's my critical point. Each previous bull run in Bitcoin's history has been followed by a significant correction. This typically happens when your non-tech family members start to ask about buying Bitcoins. On the other hand, this is the first bull run with a massive institutional adoption. So the question is, are we at the peak yet? Well, I don't know. The next article is in German and it's about Licke. And uh, this is a brief reminder, not your keys, not your coins. While Bitcoin's rise above 100,000 US dollar is capturing headlines worldwide, there's another story that deserves our attention. One that teaches us a fundamental lesson about cryptocurrency security. In Switzerland, the cryptocurrency exchange Lika is closing its doors this week. This shutdown leaves countless customers uncertain about the fate of their digital assets. The exchange, one part of the Switzerland promising crypto valley in Zug, faced a devastating hack last summer, losing 22 million Swiss francs worth of cryptocurrency. But the problem runs deeper. Financial record shows the company had been struggling since 2020 with millions in losses and inadequate liquid assets to cover their obligations. What makes the situation particularly concerning is that Lika never received regulatory approval from Switzerland's financial authority, Finma. This means their customers' assets aren't protected by any deposit insurance, a safeguard that traditional bank customers take for granted. Some customers are now alleging that the exchange used their assets without permission, gathering in online groups to discuss potential recovery strategies. And the timing of this closure is particularly ironic as we witnessed Bitcoin's new price records. The story serves as a reminder of a crucial principle in cryptocurrencies, not your keys, not your coins. When you keep your cryptocurrency on an exchange, you're essentially trusting that exchange with your digital assets. You're hoping they'll maintain proper security, manage funds responsibility and remain operational. The Lika situation demonstrates that even in country renowned for its banking sector, cryptocurrency exchanges can fail, taking customer assets with them. 
The old wisdom still holds true. If you don't control your private keys, you don't truly own your cryptocurrency. And this isn't just about security, it's about understanding the very essence of what makes cryptocurrency revolutionary. The ability to truly own and control your digital asset. And this is one of the key learning also in this lesson. The next story is about Solana. So the Solana ecosystem faced a serious supply chain attack that illustrates why we need to rethink our approaches to dependencies in blockchain projects. And here is what happened. The official Solana Web 3.js library, downloaded roughly 350,000 times per week, was compromised. The attackers managed to publish two malicious versions of this essential JavaScript SDK. This wasn't just any library, it's the core tool developers use to interact with the Solana blockchain. And the attack was sophisticated yet straightforward. The attackers gained access to a publish access account and inserted malicious code that specifically targeted cryptocurrency private keys. Every time developers or applications used certain key functions like creating key pairs or handling private keys, the malicious code would secretly send these keys to the attacker servers. And within hours, they managed to steal approximately 184,000 US dollars worth of cryptocurrency and tokens. And what makes this particularly concerning is the library's legitimate status. This wasn't some obscure package, this was the official Solana JavaScript SDK. Developers trusted it implicitly as they should have been able to. The incident forces us to confront an uncomfortable truth about modern development practices. We've all been taught the principles of don't repeat yourself. We've learned to leverage existing libraries and avoid reinventing the wheel. But in the blockchain space, where we're handling real money and valuable assets, perhaps we need to reconsider this approach. Think about it. Do you really need this dependency? If a library's critical functionality is just 15 or 20 lines of code, wouldn't it be safer to understand that code thoroughly and incorporate it directly into your project? Yes, it might feel like you're breaking the don't repeat yourself principle, but you're also reducing your attack surface and taking full responsibility of your code's security. Remember, every dependency in your project is a potential vulnerability. When that dependency handles private keys or other sensitive cryptographic operations, the stakes become even higher. The Solana incident shows us that even officially widely used libraries can be compromised. And this isn't just about being paranoid, it's about being pragmatic. In traditional web development, a compromised library might leak user data. In blockchain development, a compromised library can instantly drain millions of assets. There's no password reset, no customer service to call, no undo button. And the next time you're about to add a dependency to your blockchain project, ask yourself, do I really need this entire library? Do I need the Uniswap SDK or can I just call the contracts directly? Could I implement it just the specific functionality I need? Do I understand what this code is doing? Sometimes copying and understanding 20 lines of code is better than importing 20,000 lines you have not read. And security in blockchain development isn't just about writing secure code, it's about making secure architectural decisions. Every dependency is a decision, so choose wisely. Last week, we looked at Pump.fun, a platform for creating Solana-based meme coins. Today, we need to discuss some disturbing development that highlights the darker side of cryptocurrency speculation. The platform which allows users to create tokens and live stream content has become a showcase of concerning behavior. What started as a tool for creating meme coins has evolved into something far more troubling. Users are leveraging the live stream feature to create pressure for token price manipulation through deeply concerning methods. Some of these incidents are disturbing. We are seeing reports of individuals threatening self-harm if their token don't reach certain prices. 
others allegedly broadcasting dangerous and potential criminal behavior, all in an attempt to influence token prices. While the platform claims to have moderators working around the clock, the community is calling for more stringent controls or a complete shutdown of the live stream feature. And they did shut it down. It's getting crazy. The combination of easy token creation, live streaming capabilities and the potential for quick profits has created a perfect storm. Let's continue with Pump and Dump with the Hawk 2 token. It's the following article here. And what makes this particularly interesting is not the scheme itself, but rather the dynamics and participants involved. Let's look at what happened. The Hawk token launched on December 4th and quickly reached a staggering market capitalization of 490 million US dollars. Within just three hours, it had crashed 91%, settling at around 41.7 million US dollars. And the numbers are striking, but what's more interesting is the mechanisms behind them. At launch, between 80% to 90% of the token supply was controlled by a combination of insider wallets and snipers, automated systems designed to buy large amounts of tokens instantly at launch, one particular wallet managed to grab 17.5% of the supply in seconds, investing around 990,000 US dollars worth of wrap Solana. And this wallet then sold its position for a 1.3 million US dollar profit within nine minutes. Well, and here's my opinion. While some investors lost significant amounts, one person dropped 43,000 and another lost 1.3 million, converting from another meme coin, we need to consider the context. These aren't naive investors, I believe, being fooled by a complex scheme. These are participants who understand what game they're playing. The reality is most people buying these tokens aren't looking for long-term value or believing in some grand project vision. They're gambling on their ability to time the market, to buy during the pump and sell before the dump. Sure, we are seeing the usual aftermath complaining to the SEC law firms advertising their services to those who lost money and social media outrage. But let's be honest, anyone investing in a meme coin launched through a decentralized exchange with a questionable crypto advocate, for example, here, the Hawk2 girl, knows exactly what they're getting into. They're not buying for the fundamentals. They're buying for the potential to flip their investment before the inevitable crash. Don't get it wrong, this isn't about defending pump and dump schemes. They're problematic and often illegal in traditional markets for good reason. But in the wild west of cryptocurrency meme coins, participants are well aware of the risks. They're not victims of deception so much as victims of their own optimism that they'll be faster, smarter or luckier than other players in the same game. It's important to understand what they are high-risk gambling mechanisms where participants knowingly take on enormous risks for the chance of quick profits. Some will win, many will lose. The last article is not from the crypto world, it's about no net November. I did not participate as I did not know that this challenge existed, but next year um, I'll for sure try. It's the following article here. No Net November is a challenge for participants to disable IPv4 and rely on IPv6 for their networking needs. And NET stands for Network Address Translation, a necessary mechanism due to the scarcity of IP version 4 addresses. And the author did the challenge in November, and here are his observations. At the desktop level, modern operating systems handle IP version 6 connectivity surprisingly well. macOS, Windows 11, Ubuntu 24.4, Fedora 41 all operated seamlessly without IP version 4. Mobile devices, particularly iOS, also performed flawlessly 
And this shows how major operating system vendors have embraced IP version 6 as the future of networking. However, the experiment revealed some interesting gaps. Gaming consoles like the Nintendo Switch completely refused to connect without IP version 4. Even the Linux based Steam Deck, despite recognizing IP version 6 addresses, ultimately failed to establish a proper connection. Common networking equipment, particularly management interfaces of switches and access points, remained stubbornly IP version 4 only. The web service landscape was equally mixed, while many sites worked fine over IP version 6. Some major platforms like GitHub, Reddit, Discord and Steam still don't support IP version 6. And this created a significant hurdle for daily internet use. And the solution was to use a transition technology, particularly 6.4. 6x slot, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, which combines NOT64 and DNA64 to allow IP version 6 only networks to access IP version 4 resources. So uh, next November, I'll be joining the IPv6 only challenge because who needs not when you have an address base of 340 on decillion IP addresses with IP version 6, that is 2 to the power of 128.